Okay, you ready to get started? Let's do it. Okay, so today John and I are on Facebook Live to answer some of your back to school related uh, questions. Uh, John will answer some general questions that you might have about um, sending your child back to school within the context of a pandemic. Um, John is a pediatrician and internal medicine physician. He um, has treated patients with COVID-19. Um, and so he has a little bit of insight, uh, more than some other people, um, about you know some of the risk and some of the ways to remain safe. Um, I'm a former elementary school teacher. I taught second and third grade. Um, and I also have my PhD in education. Um, so I have a little bit of insight um, about education. I'll also be uh, taking the lead in um, helping my nieces to uh, adapt to remote learning for the fall. This discussion was partially motivated uh, by the fact that over the course of this pandemic, you often watch the news and um, you see political leaders and experts and professionals who say one thing on TV related to what they think you should do and how you should live your life. Um, but when it actually comes to what they are personally doing, they're often doing something very different. Um, so for instance, uh, Trump um, is fighting for in-person instruction and for teachers and students to be at school, but his son's private school will not open until October 1st. That's the earliest. And it's partly because uh, people have deemed it unsafe for students and teachers to return to in-person instruction. Um, I've also seen a lot of debates about, you know, whether parents should be worried about their children. Um, falling behind and you know I see some people say hey I'm taking a relaxed approach you know I'm not going to pressure my children to learn a lot during this stressful time that's what they say but then I personally know that behind the scenes they're hiring private tutors or um, they are personally tutoring their own children to make sure that they uh, remain ahead of the curve and I don't like the disparities between what people say or what professionals say and what they do. Another reason this was motivated is because uh, Wednesday, John was actually on a panel and they asked a question to the, the healthcare professionals about what they were doing with their own children. And John originally was not going to answer the question because we don't have children. Uh, but then they asked him to answer anyway. And I could tell that his response was measure. Uh, he didn't want to say the wrong thing because he's like, you know, I don't have children. What do I have to say? But again, he is a pediatrician and John and I often have conversations at home about what we want our family members to do. We have lots of nieces and nephews and what we would personally do with our children. So we're approaching this conversation as professionals who have insight, but also people who we would have certain practices at home and we just kind of want to give y'all the real on what we would do with the knowledge that we have as medical and education professionals. Um, so I'm going to try to pull up uh, the live in case some of y'all um, are uh, asking questions. I'm going to try to mute that. that. But uh, to make sure I don't hear it, but I do want to be able to, uh, we do want to be able to uh, see uh, some of your questions. Um, and while you guys are maybe teeing up to answer or ask some questions, I'm going to start. Um... Oh, thank you, Dr. Gordon. Yes. <laughs> I, I do work with children and I love them so much. Um, but I'm going to start by asking John some health related questions because he does have to get back to studying. Um, and so these are some questions that we kind of talk about frequently. And if you have any, you can begin asking as well. Uh, so I wanna just share the, uh, my screen for a second uh, because there have frequently been some, some headlines. And I actually don't know if you guys can see the screen, um, but uh, what I am depicting on the screen is um, a headline that says 97,000 children reportedly test positive for COVID-19 in two weeks as schools gear up for instruction. Um, also uh, depicted on the screen, um, oh, you guys can see it. 
Okay, also depicted on the screen um, are the photos, the controversial photos from the um, Georgia school that reopened and ended up suspending students because, uh, you know, there was no social distance and the half children didn't even have masks on. And so I just kind of want to get John's reaction to the headline that 97,000 children have tested positive and also get his reaction to this photo. I'm going to stop sharing since you guys can see it, but um, yeah. So we, I know we've talked about this. The headline is catchy. It definitely catches your eye. So you see a 97,000, you're like, when were they tested? Were they symptomatic? A lot of questions come along with that. But just from that initial reaction, you see the pictures with that number. It begs the question, what protocols, what plan did they have in place that would even lead to that picture and into the headline? So one of the main things from a healthcare standpoint and parent standpoint, educator is we're gonna open these schools, then what plans are we gonna have in place to help mitigate these risk factors? And with all the things you hear about, you see that picture of all the group of people, you're like, well, something happened. You don't want to think that picture's misleading or it's factual. And then you're like, what happened? So, I mean, my gut reaction is a lot of questions of why and kind of like concern. Okay, so if your child went to that school, mm -hmm. what questions would you be asking <laughs> to the principal? Uh, so, where the mask at? Um, is this the standard that we wanted to happen? Did the plan that we had in place and that happened because of some reason? Is anyone we know positive or symptomatic? Like this, a lot of questions I would automatically just want to answer is this going to be the way of life that we're having now? And the other question I have is, what is the infection rate in our community as well? Because if it's high and then you see that, then that's also concerning. Okay, so what if the infection what if the infection rate is fairly low when you see a picture like that? Same questions, not my how my heart isn't racing as quickly. Okay. The same similar questions. So when you say infection rate, like so for instance, in Hamilton County, I know that uh there uh the plan is in place that if the countywide numbers are X number, then they go to a different phase of instruction. So it's just kind of like I guess looking at overall community infection rate right. and if it's fairly low, it doesn't mean there isn't a risk, but it's lower than it would be if you have one of those hot spots where hundreds and thousands of people are being tested positive and your household rate is being increased. That's a different risk. Okay. Okay. Um, I think the other question I have is what would you be saying to your child if they were at that school? That school looks like with teenagers. Uh, yeah. I would ask them, were you wearing your mask? Were you washing your hands? The things that we would be talking about before school started, just reinforcing it. And I mean, that's going to be dependent on your kid, the age, but it's basically reinforcing the things that we as adults should be doing. You want your kids to be doing in public and stuff. And we'll be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, and you could do it for low, medium, high risk. So like say the community risk is, or the community numbers are fairly low. Yeah. Um, would you send your child back to the school or would you try to find alternatives? I honestly, I might try to find alternatives. Yeah. But I also know that I might have the resources to do that too. So yeah. I'm a little biased. But so <laughs> if, if, it's, if it's high, would it be like a, Heck no, like absolutely not. It would be a strong, a strong uh, factor, yes. Yeah. Okay. And probably because they, like you don't, we don't, there's a lot of unknowns. So me, my personality, all the unknowns, if I have a way to kind of give myself a little cushion of safety, I'm gonna default that way. Okay. I know uh, one question I have, cause I have a lot of, well, in the South, we're mm -hmm. both from the South. Uh, sports is really popular, yeah. football, all of that. Would you allow your child to play sports this year? It depends on a couple of things. It also depends on what sport. Okay. So if uh, sports like tennis, sure, right? You're, you're automatically spaced. Um, there's, there's ways to put, um, to mitigate the risk. Golfing, sure. 
bowling shirt. I'm talking about like basketball, which I love football. Then you got a couple of other things that you got to consider. Um, baseball, softball, sure. Things that are very much like spaced outdoors, then yeah, definitely have the discussion. We're talking about indoors, close contact. It's a little more uh, specific discussion. Okay, okay. And uh, previously, uh, earlier in the pandemic, there was, you know, these suggestions that maybe kids would not get it as, uh, mm -hmm. or were not as susceptible to COVID-19 as adults. And we're starting to see, okay, well, that was a lie, or that was an un unknown, right. and now we do know. Uh, now that we do know, would you say that, like, children in terms of presenting symptoms and stuff, is it are there differences between like how children present and how adults present? Yeah, I mean, the, the symptoms are the same, but the way they present is going to vary. We still, at this time, still feel that kids are probably going to be less infected or even less severe symptoms compared to adults. Mm -hmm. What that means moving forward in terms of can kids spread to adults, still inconclusive, but the symptoms are going to vary. So the fever is still going to be common. Likely kids might have more maybe GI symptoms than adults. Mm -hmm. It's just having that index of suspicion. I always, when I talk to parents and ask them that question, I tell them the symptoms and I always give that default. If you're truly unsure, then yeah, talk to your pediatrician. I don't want you to be in doubt and worried and not feel like you have an outlet. Like, talk to your pediatrician. Pediatricians, healthcare providers, we know these are uncertain times. So that should always be your goal to use that resource if you have it. And if you don't have it, look out and get that resource. Okay. Um, I have read something about that, like sometimes children have this like weird disorder to where like, it's like a delayed response. Mm -hmm. And like there's some inflammate, what is that called? It's the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Okay. And it's a very long name that we kind of just, I sound like we just put together multi-systems, it affects different organ sy systems, and there's an inflammatory response. It is something that we, or healthcare um, providers are seen as a rare complication, but how it's caused, what its prognosis, how to effectively treat, have some ideas, those are still all up in the air, we're still gathering information. We just know that there's a possibility this is highly associated, so we keep our eye out for it. And I guess what are like symptoms of inflammation? Like what would I be looking out for? Right now I kind of see it as something we know that happens in kids called like Kawasaki's. And so we see similarities, meaning so you might have a rash. Um, they'll have like nausea and vomiting, which is a little bit different than the other disease, but rash, some GI symptoms, the fevers there maybe some joint pain is also um, injected eyes, like red eyes, those kind of symptoms all together with the suspicion of COVID, mm -hmm. that story, then it makes you think of that. Okay, one thing I wanted to know, because um, I, read a, I, I read a lot about COVID. <laughs> I'm, I'm like really paranoid, so I read a lot about I feel it. Like, I feel like you are more of a COVID expert than me at this point. <laughs> Look, I didn't want to get on here pretending to be a medical doctor. So I'm like, you come on and you can just confirm everything I read. Uh, but I read an article like earlier in the pandemic, probably like April or May, uh, that talked about how some people might not even realize that they're having this, um, these breathing, pro like the breathing problems aren't symptomatic. So they have like low oxygen saturation, but they look normal and they're presenting normally, but then all of a sudden, I guess the yeah. effects of that quickly take hold. And one of the articles I read uh, kind of promoted uh, this ox oximeter. Pulse ox oximeter, yeah. Pulse, pulse oximeter. And you like turn it on and you like put your finger in. And you know, what I read is that like the, the reading is supposed to be above 95. Yeah, about 90, 45, yeah. And so it, it was one of those things I got so paranoid. I ordered one for our house and my mom's <laughs> house and my sister's house and my brother got one as well. Is this 
useful or am I, or am I just being paranoid? It is useful. And you're paranoid if you're saying it's paranoid. It's not unjustified. Earlier when you read that information, it was early in the pandemic. And so, yeah, we were seeing, you hear stories and cases of people who, like you said, their oxygen level is low, but they look fine. Mm -hmm. And then like a couple of days and weeks later, they just decompensate. And we heard enough of these stories. You're like, well, if they're not sick enough to be in the hospital and you're like, in your clinic doctor, then like, how can I, how can I follow my patients and help them? So a post oximeter is not unreasonable. I would say, also, I'll say with caution though, if you're not familiar with using it and interpreting numbers, you should do it in conjunction with your doctor as well. Okay. So okay. you don't want to just be getting it and you're like, it's low. Then you have no idea what it means. You're freaking out because there's a lot of other things with it or you have nail polish, you're not reading right. Mm. Is your like that will affect the reading. There are other things to consider. Okay, so nail polish, anything else? If you have poor circulation, poor circul poor circulation in general, that could affect the reading. Okay. How do you know if you got poor circulation though? Some people their fingers will tint their blue. It's better okay. to see this. Is it cold? Are your fingers cold? Okay, okay. Cold fingers would also play <laughs> as well. So you don't you want to do it in conjunction with a health provider. That way when you tell them information, they know you, they know your medical history. They can appropriately interpret it for you. Okay. Otherwise, you're just going to freak out and just add anxiety, which you don't want to do. Okay. <laughs> just want to say, hey, CC, hey, uh, LS, how are you? And we also have a question. Somebody's asking, like, safety on university uh, campuses. So it's just kind of like a. <laughs> that is a tough and complex question. I think the same rules apply with opening schools in any place with a lot of people is comes back to that basic principle for mitigation and precautions. So do they have enough like so many like hand sanitizer available? Have they expanded resources for that or access to that? Have they expanded access and resources for cleaning supplies? Mm -hmm. Have they expanded like access to masks? If the college campuses in terms of their clinic thought about protocols or testing if need be, or the university thought about protocols if someone gets sick. Like these are the short-term and those long-term considerations that you just like have to plan for the worst. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it's okay, Joey, we'll fill you in. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that um, I kind of wanted to know, um, cause like one of my students who, she was my second grade student, like. 10 years ago and now she's a freshman in college and she's moved into a residence hall and she has a roommate um as well so it's just kind of like a any advice any i don't know for one uh if that's your roommate i guess i would say like that's your household person so meaning like you and i live in the same also like we are not going a lot to abuse households just randomly, right? Mm -hmm. So both of them, I would say, keep track of their symptoms. Um, basically be a good store, be a good neighbor. So like if that's your roommate, probably don't wanna be going out to large events and parties when your roommate is not, and then you just bring whatever virus back, right? Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. It's, that's tough. That, that's a tough, yeah, that's a tough question. <laughs> Actually, I think about it. Yeah, it is. Um, people gotta go to school. Like, if you're in college and you gotta go to college, I mean, and this guy's staying on campus, like, what are you gonna do? Like, your options are trying to get an apartment off campus. If you can't afford that, then you're stuck in your dorm. So, you gotta do the best with what you can do. Yeah. Uh, that that makes sense. Um, I would personally advise to stay away from the parties. Um, we've seen over the last couple of months that a lot of the spread, uh, the super spreader events have actually been like parties and kickbacks and stuff that people are having at home. So it's like, I know you probably really want to enjoy your freshman year and you want to go wild a little bit, but eh, Maybe save it to next year after we have a vaccine. Um. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. You've been locked up for months and months and it's still warm outside if you're in a place that has a harsh winter. 
you miss people. Mm-hmm. So it's it's trying to find that balance and mitigate the risk the best you can. You know what? The other question I have, we don't have, well, we have cloth masks where you can put filter in. Are cloth masks useful? I was actually looking that up earlier to see if any new um, studies or data came out to that. Cloth, ma- cloth masks are still shown to be effective. Okay. Compared to wearing nothing. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I guess the last question I have is because uh, wearing masks has become like this huge political thing when it really shouldn't be. When you look at some other countries, uh, they've been wearing like masks on a daily basis before there was even a pandemic. How, what, how would you talk to like your young child and an older child about the importance of wearing these masks? For friends and colleagues who I got asked them this question in terms of like their younger kids. And they said, they just, they keep reinforcing for the mask. And if they're old enough, you tell them like kids ask, why do they wear a mask? They say, well, you, because you want to protect your friends and family. Mm-hmm. I think most kids are a certain age, that simple concept, they can grasp that. They don't want to get their friends sick. You keep reinforcing that. You practice it as well. So they see you doing it. Um, so yeah. practice what you preach. Practice what you preach. Kids are always watching. You do that, depend on the age, and that should be the same for each age group. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that sticks. Reinforcing why we're doing it. Re- seeing them, the parents do it. I think that's probably the best option you have at this point. Mm-hmm. Teach your kids how to wear a mask. Yeah. Teach them anything else. Yeah. Like my mom, who's watching, she taught me a lot of important lessons. So listen to your mom, folks. <laughs> um, before I let you get back to studying, because I'll be on here, I'm going to share some education v- advice next, and he's just going to be moving over to a desk. So if you do ask some questions, I'll just bring them back over. Um, but any other um, advice or insight or anything you might have for teachers, even, because we talked about kids, but how are teachers going to remain safe? Like I actually just came across a story, I think it was an, an Arizona teacher. Mm-hmm who was a music teacher and they wanted him to still teach music, singing and instruments uh, in person. And it's like, that's not safe. You're bl- literally, <laughs> uh, so how can teachers remain? Cause that's like a tough position. Most people can't just quit. Right. I, I feel, I feel my dad's in education. So I had this conversation with him as well. And I feel for them because being in that environment where you have the potential to be exposed mm-hmm. is, you know, disconcerting. I guess the advice I would give is, it's not like a broken record, but those same mitigation factors. Like we have seen that wearing the mask, face shields even have them are effective. It's not useless. Um, Hand washing. Doing those things, being cognizant of washing your hands, especially if, if you're about to touch your face, you're about to eat, wash your hands, wear the mask, avoid pulling the mask down and touching your face. But those small things do help. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to be in that environment, definitely make sure that you have those tools and then make sure to advocate that your colleagues, in terms of advocate to your school yeah. system, that they have those resources for you. So if you were if you were a teacher, you would have a face mask. If I had the option and it was provided, yes. Okay, so I'm like, yeah, I feel you, so hard. Like, uh, Arnetta, like, I have a lot of friends. So as a teacher, a former teacher, I have lots of friends who are still in the classroom. And to be honest, uh, before this all happened, and I was uh, graduating uh, with my PhD, I had didn't I tell you I was like. Well, I enjoy teaching. So if I didn't get a job as a professor, I was like, I'm gonna go back to the classroom. Like that was the funnest and best time of my life. And that quickly changed as it was just kind of like a, oh, (laughs) I don't know about that. Um, At least not right now. So that's kind of where these videos come from. I want to help in some way, especially with children's education, but it's it's really risky. I would, if I had to go into the classroom, Mm -hmm. I would be gloved up. I would have my um, regular kind of face mask on. And then I would have like that 
facial covering because kids, they cough and they sneeze and they, uh, they know a lot of things that we love them, but it's kind of gross. Yeah, and it's hard, I mean, depending on what you're teaching, depending on what class it's, how do you social distance effectively? Um, you can do that, spread a desk out. But yeah, you take the best options to protect yourself and your students and your colleagues you can, so. No small step is wasteful, I guess. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Fonge, well, for you. joining me. You can scoot on over. Oh, she's kicking me out. Uh, right. And I, <laughs> what I'm going to do is just talk for maybe like a, another minute or two to actually show you some slides of the websites and resources that I uh, mentioned on Friday uh, because I couldn't figure out how to uh, edit the post to add them. So I'm just going to. You guys just like take a picture with your phone with some of the uh, websites that I'm gonna list. So. Well, thank you for having me on your platform. <laughs> of course. And doing what you do to empower people and keep them informed. We all appreciate you. Yeah, we appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Gordy and Dr. Zachary for the the shout out. Okay, now time to talk a little bit about education and some of the resources that I uh, shared on Friday. Um, again, um, I come from, uh, or come to, you know, these resources and stuff, kind of, a lot of this stuff is what I used in the classroom as a teacher, so it kind of, um, I would use them sometimes as a guide or sometimes to fill in, like the daily math practice, it wasn't something that I just got on Google and um, chose, it was because every morning when my students walked into the school building or walked into the classroom, they knew to sit down and do their daily math practice and it was just a good way for them to get that daily practice in. One thing that I didn't mention on Friday is like when you open up like the math practice books, whether it's this brand or another one, the table of contents will show you everything, all the concepts that they will learn over the course of the school year. So for instance, um, actually in like first, second and third grade, um, they're learning a lot of the same concepts, but it just kind of, um, like, so for instance, if they're learning place value in first grade, they might be learning uh, the ones, the tens, and the hundreds. In second grade, they might increase to the uh, hundreds, uh, the ten or the thousands, the ten thousands, the hundred thousand. In third grade, it just kind of keeps building. So it's kind of like, even if your child missed out on some things in the spring or the fall at those early grades, mm, it's... I won't say it's not a big deal, but it's just kind of like, okay, I'll, they're learning a lot of the same concepts. Um, so like place value and rounding, multiplication. Um, and the biggest thing about that is not necessarily memorizing the facts. It is helping them to understand that like multiplication is simply repeated addition. You're two times four is just adding two together four times or adding four together two times. And it's kind of helping them understand like the concepts underneath. One thing that I would also suggest that parents do, especially in the early education grades, um, children are essentially learning a lot of the skills that you could teach around the house. So learning how to tell time, learning how to count money, uh, getting number sense, the early addition. So if I were you, this is this is what I would do if I had a, a first, second, or third grader. I would I would just buy a, a old school clock and teach them how to tell time. Frequently ask them to go tell you the time. Uh, we have a coin shortage in the United States, so it might be difficult to practice this. But you know, if you are going to the store, you know, have them count out the change or have them like if you have like a. a piggy bank or something like that at home, you know, have them group in coins. So I think there are a lot of things that you could probably do at home that you might not have even like thought about um, beforehand. Another book that I ordered and I'll share my screen is, um, okay, 
So you will probably see uh, their website. So Khan Academy, which I mentioned Friday, that's completely free, um, education.com. You can download three resources, I think per month for free, but otherwise you have to pay for it. I think it's like $79 a year. ABC Mouse, I think they have some free resources. Sightwords.com is free. And what I like about sightwords.com is that you can go online and print. Um, they have lots of like uh, first, second, third, fourth uh, grade sight words, and you can just print out the flashcards that they have. Um, or, you know, one good exercise might be to buy some index cards and have your children um, to write down those words. Uh, but one of the most important things about sight words um, your children, they really need to learn those because often those are words that they will have difficulty sounding out. It's not something um, that would just naturally uh, come to them. And so you can build up their read fluency and help them to become really fast readers if they can get through those sight words. If you'll notice this book right here, this is the uh, another recent book that I um, bought for my uh, niece, it is Daily Phonics um, because, you know, I, I do want her to be able to know, recognize the sounds and words and easily be able to get through them. And then there's this fourth grade uh, daily writing um, because usually in the fifth grade, there's like a writing test and they should be able to write, you know, that standard five paragraph essay. So you're not going to be able to teach them everything, but if you focus on reading, writing, and math, they're good, um, in my opinion. That's what I'm doing. They're Spelling City. Uh, they have, um, they're free for the most part, and they already have some uh, built-in, like, spelling lists per, by grade level or by topic that you can go ahead and use for your children. Um, in addition to that, Fun Brain has some really fun math games that I used to have my second and third graders to play. So like place value games, addition games, uh, multiplication games, because children will uh, learn it to be fun. And then finally, playmath.com was another website that I shared. Um, and if you look at these like daily practice books, there are two different brands. Um, the brand where you see my cursor going, these are actually the brands that I used when I was in the classroom, um, but I ordered these Common Core ones now because that's kind of what we switched over, um, and I really wanted my niece to be familiar with the language of like how they're answering questions. Another important skill that uh, children learn in elementary school is like measurement, and I I think it's important for you to like get past like getting your child to understand uh, or to memorize the facts. Um, it is just like helping them to understand the concepts behind the facts. So if you're cooking and you're using measuring cups, you know, have your child to do it and help them understand like, oh, this is, you know, a full cup versus a half versus a fourth of a cup and what that actually means. Um, buy some rulers and some yardsticks to help them understand uh, the concept of measurement and how, you know, 12 inches is the same thing as a foot um, or 36 inches is the same thing um, as a yard uh, or three feet is a yard like those are the types of things that you kind of want to help them understand and you can do it in really fun ways without trying to get them to uh, memorize things in particular um those were kind of like some of the additional key points i had in addition to like the resources i shared um if no one else has any questions of course you can always inbox me uh, thank you, Christina. I really appreciate that and appreciate you for tuning in, Doc. Um, uh, Kevon, you can always go back. This video will be posted on uh, my page, so uh, you can always just go back and uh, see it, Kevon. And of course, you can always inbox me. Um, the biggest thing is, um, the last thing I want to say is that we've been in this pandemic for like seven months. Uh, most of us were not prepared uh, when it happened in the spring. Everything happened so quickly. Uh, don't beat yourself up over what did or did not happen in the spring regarding your child's education. That's water under the bridge. But it's really important that as you move forward that you don't get too tired, don't grow too weary because um, 
there will be people who tell you the school will handle it. They'll, you know, they'll be catching up, but you are now in control of your child's education in a way that you weren't in the past. And it is important to step into that role. Um, it's beautiful when you have a really good idea of what your you know, children are doing. Most people are working, you're tired when you get home. And that's kind of why, you know, to have these daily resources to kind of take some of that thought process out of it. Like if you have these daily resources, you don't have to think about the lessons or think about the curriculum. Just spend like maybe 10 minutes coaching your child through it or just checking their answers um, so that you can reduce your cognitive load while you are like working and cooking and figure out uh, a million other things. But now is really not the time to grow tired because these rich folks are out here hiring private teachers and private tutors to uh, teach their children in these educational pods. And when this is all over, those children, they're not gonna be behind. Um, and we have to make sure that we're doing our part to make sure that we're not getting left behind either. And so I'm here as a resource when it comes to health. Yes, John is here as a resource. He just raised his hand, but I was like, he's going to be a resource whether he wants to or not. Um, but we're in this together. Um, but don't grow too tired because uh, this, is, this is just starting. And we have to make sure that our children continue to have the options that they want, um, whether that's college or not. But we just have to make sure uh, that they are able to do what they want. And that is supporting uh, through supporting their learning. So thank you for joining once again. Um, I'll probably check in with you guys like maybe later in the month. Uh, feel free to inbox me any questions if you don't want to uh, ask anything publicly, um, but I will probably use them on future recordings because um, what I notice is a lot of times we have questions, but we don't want to be the person that uh, asks them um, and everybody's feeling the same way. So um, don't feel like you're in this alone. Um, use your resources. Um, so thank you.